All right, today we're going inside Chapter 9 of Project 2025 on the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. USAID currently distributes aid to 153 countries in the form of humanitarian assistance, health infrastructure, and economic development. Project 2025 sees USAID's status as one of the world's biggest humanitarian organizations and they see it as an opportunity to export right-wing culture wars, obsessions, uh, American obsessions, to the world. We'll show you what we mean, starting with abortion. On page 260 in Project 2025, it calls for the reinstating the protection, uh, protecting life in global health assistance policy. It's widely known as the Mexico City policy. This is an old policy that blocks U.S. federal funding for organizations that perform or promote abortion as a method of family planning in foreign countries, first introduced by Ronald Reagan. Now, if the Mexico City policy's goal was to stop abortion, it didn't work. Countries in sub-Saharan Africa that were affected by the Mexico City policy, for example, saw increased abortion rates, according to this 19, uh, 2019 study featured in the Lancet Global Health Journal. On page 265, Project 2025 asserts, quote, the continued high rate of maternal and infant mortality is a persistent global tragedy. Contrary to current publicity, this problem is not solved by abortion. That's actually contrary to reality. Decreased access to abortion means increased maternal mortality rates. We're even seeing that here in the United States since the fall of Roe. According to the World Health Organization, nearly half of all abortions conducted worldwide are considered unsafe. And according to the Guttmacher Institute, nearly 11% of all maternal mortality comes from these unsafe abortions. It's like we've been saying, abortion is health care in America and around the world. Restricting abortion means restricting women's health care. Project 2025 also wants, to, uh, wants the president to be able to dictate abortion policy worldwide. On page 261, it writes, current law in the Foreign, Assistant Act, Foreign Assistance Act gives the president broad authority to set such terms and conditions as he may determine on foreign assistance, which legally empowers the next conservative president to expand this pro-life policy. So the goal here is to hold the rights of women worldwide hostage with the carrot of U.S. aid in exchange. The chapter's War on Women continues. Page 259 of Project 2025 suggests, quote, USAID should remove all references, examples, definitions, photos, and language on USAID websites in agency publications and policies and in all agency contracts and grants that include the following terms. Listen to this. Gender. Gender equality, gender equity, gender diverse individuals, gender aware, gender sensitive, etc. It should also remove references to abortion, reproductive health, and sexual and reproductive rights, and controversial sexual education materials. This head-in-the-sand approach to those big, scary, woke words might be in line with the right wing's domestic policies, but fighting this culture war on the global stage would be an incredible disservice to women everywhere. The USAID Office of Population and Reproductive Health, one of those scary words that they also want to ban, helps fight child marriage. It supports programs aiming to end female genital mutilation and gender-based violence. But Project 2025 is so immersed in this right-wing culture war that it abandons all other reasoning. Case in point, on climate change, page 257, the aid industry claims that climate change causes poverty, which is false. And during conflict, government corruption and bad economic policies are the main drivers of global policy. Again, reality might disagree. The impact of climate change, like increased frequency of extreme weather, more droughts, harsher heat, could push more than 100 million people into poverty by 2030, according to a report from the World Bank. Not keep 100 million people in poverty, push 100 million more people into poverty. But this page 257 is chock full of ideas. It also suggests that the next conservative administration should rescind all climate policies from its foreign aid program, specifically USAID's climate strategy 2022 to 2030, shut down the agency's offices, programs, and directives designed to advance the Paris Climate Agreement, 
and narrowly limit funding to traditional climate mitigation efforts. The agency should cease collaborating with and funding progressive foundations, corporations, international institutions, and NGOs that advocate on behalf of climate fanaticism. Climate fanaticism. That would be a death blow to the fight against global climate change. USAID's climate strategy is full of goals to reduce emission, conserve at-risk ecosystems, and develop renewable energy systems globally. Cutting this fun funding would hurt the folks already disproportionately feeling the impact of climate change. The 74 lowest income nations only contribute one-tenth of global emissions, but stand to be, be affected the most by climate change. Women as breeding stock and the world as a dumping ground. That is the uh, development, courtesy of Project 2025. Why? Joining me now is Jeremy Kandindike. He's the president of Refugee International, the former USAID lead official for COVID-19. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for being with us. Being with us. This is where Project 25 is full of nuggets that are not obvious to everybody because people don't think about these things on a daily basis. But it's really important how we look at the influence that the United States has over the world and its policies through our resources and money can be very scary. And this this book writes it all down and tells the ways in which we're going to affect the way the world thinks about a lot of these issues. Yeah, I, what is really striking when you read the chapter on USAID is how completely ensconced it is in culture war rhetoric. Uh, you know, you talked about climate fanaticism in the, in the prior segment. That phrase jumped out at me, too. There's a lot of uh, frankly, right-wing gender radicalism in here. When they talk about removing all gender programming, all language around gender, what that means in practice is women in developing countries being unable to manage their uh, manage reproduction. Uh, it, man it, it, it means that the end of gender-based violence programming, programs that prote protect women and girls from sexual abuse and exploitation, advance women's rights, advance women's ability to work. You know, th this is not trivial stuff, and. The, the kind of sole focus on abortion over everything else takes a lot of collateral damage with it. I think most Americans might think that, generally speaking, we're trying to promote uh, democracy, fairness, equality, liberty, things like that that are written in our Constitution around the world. Maybe some people think we're benign about this. People would be surprised to understand that the agenda here is to actually reverse that. So when you look at countries that have human rights abuses, that have gender abuses, that have gender mutilation, that have uh, anti-LGBTQ stuff, I think it's key to understanding that that's going to get worse under Project 2025. Yeah, I'd even go so far as to say Project 2025 would kind of ally the U.S. government with some of the forces that are reversing fundamental human rights worldwide, reversing women's rights, reversing LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus rights. Um, you know, there is this exporting of U.S. culture wars to other settings where, frankly, you know, these are not the biggest things people are focusing on. And again, I'd, I'd emphasize what comes with that are just really fundamental damages to people's ability to protect their own health and their own livelihoods. Can you contextualize a bit what it would mean to halt aid to organizations that, uh, quote, promote abortion or, quote, climate fanaticism? Um, international organizations, most of the ones we talk to, view abortion as health care, and they recognize climate change as a crisis. So what does that mean? That if, you, if these things are in your charter, you're just not, you're going you're gonna to lose potential aid from the United States to further your work? Yeah, and they even go so far as to talk about debarring, meaning making ineligible for any U.S. funding uh, organizations that in engage in those activities or have robust internal DEI programs. So they are really bringing the U.S. They would rather bring the U.S. deeply out of step with where the mainstream of the world is. Uh, I came back in on the day one team with the Biden administration to USAID, and what we found was a staff that was really shell-shocked, that was traumatized by a lot of abuse, and that had been put in this position of you know, bringing the U.S. out of step with countries that we normally work with on development cooperation who are telling us they want these programs. Uh, you know, it is not random that the World Health Organization prioritizes uh, you know, gender considerations in health care, because we know that that is a crucial factor in providing effective health care. So, you know, for, for USA to be out of step with that, I don't think it changes the, where the world, the rest of the world goes, because the rest of the world, frankly, knows uh, knows the way to do these things. But it puts the U.S. out of step and makes us a kind of marginal and radical player. 
and 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 does encourage those countries, those nations, and those organizations that are trying to advance uh, some of these things uh, in, in making the world a, a less safe place for the most vulnerable Absolutely. and for those of us who are affected by climate. Jeremy, thank you uh, for joining us. Jeremy Kanindike is the president of Refugees International and a veteran of USAID.